Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes with the Clark College Network Technology Department. We're in the Intech 222 class studying Cisco CCNA2 material. This is Chapter 5, Switch Configuration. We'll be looking at two things this chapter, basic switch configuration and switch security. Basic switch configuration. We first want to talk about how a switch boots up. It boots much like any other electronic device, a phone, a computer, uh, it does what's called a post or power on self test. Most devices have this to ensure that the, the key components, the CPU, the RAM, the interfaces, different things, the fan, uh, different components are working correctly. So the power on self test is a test it does. Um, similarly, your automobile does a similar thing. When you turn the key in the ignition, takes a moment and the little lights may come on on the on the dashboard to indicate different problems. A switch is similar, it has some indicator lights that might flash, but uh, everything's usually good to go and it just takes a, uh, takes a few seconds and that's completed. Once post is completed, uh, a bootloader is run. A bootloader is a tiny piece of software stored with the post. They're both stored in, in something called ROM. And so in that ROM or EE ROM in your um, electronically erasable ROM, uh, you have post and a bootloader. The job of the bootloader is to find an operating system. And so the bootloader gets the CPU initialized, mounts a file system, searches the file system looking for an operating system. In this case, the flash uh, file system. And so continuing with the boot uh, sequence here then, it's going to go through the boot environment uh, variable to look where it's supposed to look. So that bootloader is going to use a boot environment variable. That essentially is like a BIOS if you've used a PC where you can uh, change the settings in, in a BIOS about how the device uh, boots up and does things. Uh, the boot environment you can uh, actually change with the boot system command shown here on the screen. So on the screen, it shows the command you can use to change the name of the iOS operating system to boot from, because you might have more than one in your flash. It's possible you have two or three operating systems, or you can also have it boot from something other than flash. Some devices allow the use of more than one flash, an external USB uh, device may be used in some models. Uh, you could also boot off a TFTP or FTP server. So there's a number of different options in terms of where to find the operating system, and you can uh, change those using the boot system command. The boot loader can also manage the switch if the iOS can't be loaded. So if there's a failure in finding an operating system, the um, boot loader will present you with a prompt, you know, which just says switch. With a, with a colon, right? So little different than the prompts you're used to with the caret or with the pound sign, the hash sign, you're going to see this prompt with a colon and it does not respond to iOS commands. It is not the Cisco iOS. This is a low level um, command line interface to the switch to allow disaster recovery. So this is a disaster recovery mode. Essentially it allows you to manually format your flash and upload an operating system to it so that you can regain uh, usability of the switch. You have several indicator lights over on the left panel of a 2000 series Cisco switch, like a 2950 or a 2960, and you can um, cycle through those with the mode button, and those are called the modes. And what those do is they change the functionality of the port status LEDs, which are on the top of each port. Those little green and amber blinking lights uh, on the ports mean different things depending on the mode you put them in. So we're usually uh, going to start in the status mode. Um, and so the system LED or status system um, and status LEDs. So you, you're going to then see a you know green light when the status is good and an amber light when it's waiting like uh, it's uh, going through spanning tree or something and the port isn't quite active. Uh, it'll be an amber, which is a waiting state and it usually transitions to green. If it remains amber, then you have a problem or if the light doesn't come on at all. 
Although another reason the light wouldn't come on is LEDs, while they are durable, do burn out and sometimes you'll lose an indicator light. That certainly makes it more challenging to know what's going on in the switch. All of these indicators you can get internally through show commands. This is just a nice convenient way to interact with the switch without having to hook up a console cable or an SSH connection and having to open terminal software and type commands. This is a quick easy way you can get status on the switch. You can see which ports are operating in full duplex or half duplex, which ports are providing power. That's the PoE on the bottom there. So if your switch is equipped with power over ethernet, you'll have that, uh, you'll have that indicator option on the mode menu. Okay, to remotely manage a Cisco switch, um, it must be configured to access the network, right? It has to have an IP address, typically a default gateway also has to be configured. So you did this in Cisco One and you've done this in this class, you would go in the switch and you would type uh, interface VLAN one and IP address something with a mask. And then you also have to type IP default gateway and tell it what router to use to get out of the network unless you're only going to want to access the switch locally from within that, uh, that network. And we call it an SVI, so that's a switch virtual interface. Because you're assigning that IP address not to a physical port, but to a logical port group, in this case VLAN 1. So all ports are part of VLAN 1 by default, so when you have a new switch, all the ports are in VLAN 1. That means when you put that IP address on there, you can reach it from another device from any of the ports on the switch, and that's why we call it a SVI. Here's an example of configuring a management uh, VLAN. And so in this case, we're not using VLAN 1. That would be the default to use VLAN 1. In this case, we're going to make up a VLAN, VLAN 99. You can have as many VLANs, uh, one through uh, 4096 as, as you would like uh, for 4095. Um, okay, configuring switch management access. So here are the ways that you would finish doing that. You have to provide an IP default gateway if you want to externally manage the switch from say your home or out on the internet or um, in another part of the network on, um, on the other side of a router. Otherwise you could omit the IP default gateway, but it's generally a good idea to always provide it. And then you want to save your config because if the switch were to get power cycle, all those commands would disappear until you type the, con the copy running start command. And we can verify this with the show IP interface brief command, very commonly used command in a switch and a router. And this command shows all my interfaces. In this case, I have an SVI or a switch virtual interface called VLAN 99. Notice that's listed under the interface. You'll also notice when you type this command, all the physical interfaces get listed first. They, they didn't show that, but you'll have your fast ethernet 01 and 02 and 03 and so on. And then you'll get scroll down, you'll get to interface VLAN 99, and you'll see it has an IP address and that it's in an up-up status. Actually, this one's in an up-down status, isn't it? So this one's protocol down. So we haven't typed the no shut command is why. Let's talk about duplex communication. Okay, full duplex communication, you can send and receive simultaneously. We talked a little about this in chapter four when we were talking about switch ports being able to be either full or half duplex. So if they're full duplex, you're collision free on that port. You don't have any collisions because frames can easily go in and out simultaneously. Effectively doubles the port speed. So if your port was 10 megabits per second, you have an effective 20 megabits per second because you can send 10 and receive 10 simultaneously. If you're half duplex, you can only send or receive. Sometimes send then receive is how I like to think of it. You send, then you receive. Similar to how a CB radio works. And if you had a number of people in, uh, in this case devices in the group, uh, only one can send or receive at a time. So you can see you get much lower bandwidth utilization with half duplex and you run the risk of collisions. The more devices that share a half duplex connection, the more the potentiality for collisions is. With a full duplex, there are only ever two devices. So that's how full duplex is achieved. So when we have full duplex, 
we are getting uh, the full speed in both the send and receive. You want to make sure, of course, that the duplex and speed are matched on both sides. By default, the ports are in auto-auto, so they auto-duplex and auto-speed. So they will auto-detect the duplex of the other side and auto-detect the speed. If you want to manually set that on one side, you must manually set it on both. Auto only works if it's enabled on both ends. As soon as you manually type in this config on switch one, switch two will stop communicating with it until you go to switch two and manually also configure switch two for the same specifications for speed and duplex on that port. So that's uh, auto index is another auto feature. So there's a third auto. You had auto speed, auto duplex, and auto index. Auto MDIX is the ability for the switch port uh, to tell if it is a crossover or straight through cable and through software re-cable the cable and software so that it works correctly. So that allows you to use straight through cables everywhere. You don't no longer need a crossover cable at all. This MDIX spec is required with a gigabit ethernet standard. So if you have a switch, with gigabit ethernet ports. Those gigabit ethernet ports are always auto index. It's required of the gigabit standard. If you have 10 100 ports, however, it is not required. So it was optional and some switches have it on the 10 100 ports, some do not. So you wanna be um, you know, careful and check that out. You can just do a show interface, FA01 or something and see if it has auto index. But if it's a gigabit port or higher, it has auto index uh, by default. You, of course, can disable this if you want to, but disabling auto MDIX means that you would have to use the right cable type. So to interconnect two switches that are 10 or 100 megabits would require a crossover cable. With gigabit ethernet, you never use a crossover cable. So to interconnect two gigabit ethernet switch ports, you would always use a straight through cable. This is how you can um, turn on and off the MDIX. So just like the speed, if you wanted to set the speed and duplex back to auto, duplex auto, speed auto. If you don't want auto MDIX, you would type no MDIX auto. If you want auto MDIX, you type MDIX auto. Okay. And here we're typing show controllers and we're specifying ethernet controller FA01 and you're able to see that it is turned on for auto MDIX. Here's some of the show commands that are really helpful in verifying your switch port configuration. Good show interfaces is the one we, we normally will see most information with. So if you're looking for most of your settings in a single show command, it's always show interfaces. Of course, it's always nice to look at the show run and config uh, or show run for short so that you can take a look at what you've typed in, what kind of setting modifications you've got in there. So here's the show interfaces right here, and it's giving me a lot of information. I have the MAC address for the interface. That's the BIA up there, the burned in address. And um, you've got a lot of information there highlighting for you in terms of performance of this port. Zero runs, zero giants, three input errors. Three of them are CRC errors. So there are three frames that failed the CRC check. So that was an incoming frame. That's a frame on an ingress. So it was coming into the fast ethernet zero one. And as it came in, uh, because it was doing store and forward switching, it ran the CRC check and those three frames failed. Now you'll have to notice, of course, that uh, there, were, there were millions of frames that came in. So three errors is really not bad when you look that there were 2295197 packets input. So there a lot of traffic came in to get those three errors, okay? 68 of those, so very few of them were multicast, so the rest would be unicast frames. And um, you can see how many of the frames have been output. And you've got um, eight output errors. There have been 1,790 collisions and 10 interface resets. So that tells me that this port is half duplex. This port is likely half duplex because it is having collisions. Remember, if it was full duplex, it should not have collisions. Collisions on a full duplex port is a serious network problem. Um, and it, it would mean that 
probably the other end is configured for half duplex, right? If one end is figured, configured for full duplex and the other for half duplex, you'll have a lot of collisions. So that's possible here, but still that's a pretty low number given the uh, large number of packets that have been output. You still statistically have a low number of collisions. So I would guess this is just a half duplex port that's experiencing a, a, a normal amount of collisions and a normal amount of output errors. Okay, there were 235 late collisions. Those are collisions that happen after the first 64 bytes of the frame have been transmitted. Those are rare and uh, you can see there are a small number of the collisions, so probably again, nothing to worry about. But if that number were higher, that indicates again, a serious problem. Late collisions are, uh, you know, it'd be like driving your car through an intersection. Someone ran into the, the back half of the, of the side of the car instead of the front half. It's more likely they didn't see you and they clipped you in the front than they didn't see you when they ran into the back because your car would have been going by for a while and they, they should have seen that. So a late collision is similar. Your bits have been traveling down that wire for a while that some other device starts sending bits while you're still sending them would indicate a serious problem. So this is just a little, you know, kind of description of what those different errors are. What is a runt? What's a giant? What's a CRC? What are input and output errors? What's a collision? And what's a, uh, a late collision? And you can you can just kind of look those up. There's a terms uh, part to your chapter ebook. So if you want to go in there, if you've been going into the terms and definitions, you can you can get these down in your notes. Troubleshooting network access layer issues. So on the access layer, this is a little flow chart to assist in kind of kind of troubleshooting. So you'd always start with a show interface command and verify the interface is up, up, right? It might be up, down, or down, down. Those are both would be in the no. The interface is not up unless it's up, up. And um, if it is up, then you have to look for other things, right? If it's not up, it might be the cable's the wrong type or the cable's not plugged in or you just need to type no shutdown to uh, bring the interface up. So uh, it also might be that the speed or the duplex is set in incorrectly, um, you know, with the other side being auto. Uh, if one side's auto and the other side is statically set, um, the auto side won't come up. It will stay down because it's trying to talk to the other auto side to automatically determine a speed and duplex and the other side's manually set so it's not talking back. And so the auto side just kind of times out and does nothing. Uh, so if it is up, then you've got to check some of the other, you know, some of the other settings and then see if the problem solved. So this is kind of a neat chapter. I have some labs where you get to do some of this. You get to misconfigure one end or the other and then kind of uh, work through troubleshooting those problems because they're pretty common to uh, have these type of problems. Not a lot of the ports will have this, but one in every hundred ports or so is going to have this type of problem where you have to kind of figure out something's probably misconfigured or it's a bad cable or wrong cable type. So pretty simple problems to solve, but it takes some practice to be able to identify them quickly. All right, let's talk about switch security. So now that we have our switch port working, right? Now that we know how to configure the port, put an IP address on SDI, we know how to troubleshoot some common problems, how, do, how can we make things more secure? Well, we, for one, want to set up SSH access to our switch and we want to disable Telnet, right? We want to have remote access to the switch so we're not having to come down there with a console cable all the time. That actually makes the network more secure because we want to be able to intercede quickly if we're having network problems because network problems could be that we're being hacked or having a security issue. We want to be able to turn on and off our switch ports um, when we want to. And I want to be able to do that from my phone wherever I'm at. And to be able to do that, I can use a little SSH app and get right into my switch right away. But I have to set it up first. And to set it up, I have to go in the switch and tell it I want to use SSH. And we also want to turn off uh, port 23, which is Telnet, because Telnet is um, inherently insecure. Okay. We type show IP SSH to verify that the switch has SSH running, and um, it'll tell us whether SSH is configured or not. And then we go in and we start configuring it. It's going to say, 
SSH supported but not configured essentially. So then we go in there and we have to set up some things. We have to give the switch a domain name. We can just make that up, you know, so we can type IP domain name uh, whatever.com. You can just make that up. It's used in the cryptographic key. Uh, you also need to have a host name, so it doesn't say that here, but you should set a host name and a domain name. Those are two variables that are required for the RSA key that you're generating in that command here, where you have the crypto key generate RSA. It requires those two pieces of information. Notice it, it combines the host name S1 with the domain name Cisco.com, and that's, uh, that's gonna be the name of the key. Okay. Then we have to go in and um, and kind of set up login local that tells uh, login local says to use the local username and password that we've set up above. Instead of in the past, we've just used the command login and then we've set the password right on the VTY line. Here we are setting the password using the username um, secret command. And that's a variation of username password. So you could say username admin password CCNA but username admin secret CCNA. Secret means to use MD5 hash instead of the less secure MD7 hash that you would get with the, uh, with the password command. And uh, so just some small differences. And the transport input SSH is actually a command to turn off Telnet. So by default, it's transport input all. So by default, SSH and Telnet are already allowed. So by limiting it to SSH, we're saying we don't want the um, we don't want the telnet connections. Another nice thing to do is um, is making version two only. So when you type IPSSH version two, it disables version one. Now this can be a problem if you have an older client connecting to the switch, it may only support SSH uh, version one, in which case you'd wanna type no IPSSH version two, which would put it back to the default, which is one and two. By default, it will accept connections from one and two. But in this case, we're limiting it to version two only. And then try it. You're gonna have a lab where you do this and it's pretty cool. I think you'll see it right away that it's pretty flexible. If you think you're on a, a network that you set up and it's working and you wanna be able to get in there uh, next week or next month or next year at some time, whenever an event triggered or you just wanna pop in and check things over, uh, this is a nice convenient way to get into the devices on your network. If you have a SSH app, you can actually bookmark a little bookmarks for each device. So you just touch the bookmark and it pulls you right into the command line. And the command line is really awesome for a phone because uh, it's much easier to use a command line than like a remote desktop where you try to cram a whole Windows desktop or some desktop or website onto a little mobile device. A command line interface actually works really well. It's kind of like a little little chat or text uh, text box and uh, real easy to use with the keyboard. So I, I like using the SSH connections on my devices for remote connectivity. And you can type that show IP SSH command again, and this time it will tell you it's enabled, right? So, and it tells me um, some of the settings and the uh, configuration that's being used. You can type show run, and you can see which ports have been administratively shut down with the command shut down. You can go into any interface on the switch and shut it down. Uh, I like to use the range command for this. You can actually, in one command, um, you can specify a whole range of ports. So you could do like interface range fast ethernet 04-7 and that would allow you to type shut down once and it would apply it to all four of those interfaces for you. So there's some tricks to doing it faster, but right now the important thing is to identify the ports that are unused and manually shut them down, realizing in a switch all ports are up and active by default. Right? So here's where you can set some security using MAC addresses. So you can tell the switch that only certain MAC addresses are allowed on an interface, on a port. So in this case, you can manually type in, you could type switch port, port security MAC address and type in the MAC address of, of your PC or your device and only that device would be able to connect to that port. The port would play dead for any other device. So if you plugged in another device, it would uh, create what's called a security violation and it would shut down the port. 
You can also use a different technique for lazy people, which I use, which is switch port, port security, MAC address, sticky. So instead of, notice this is the same exact command, but instead of specifying the MAC address, you just type sticky. And what this means is, I don't know the MAC address, but I'm gonna plug the device in right now and record the first MAC address of the first device that plugs in this port. So it's super cool because you can type this in and then plug the PC in and it will automatically learn the MAC address off the frame and, uh, and record that. So it's a, a nicer way to do it so that you don't run the risk of uh, fat finger mistakes where you might mistype a MAC address and then it, you know, it creates a big work hassle because now that device doesn't work and you have to troubleshoot that and then eventually you figure out you have the wrong hexadecimal character, you got something mixed up. Um, that happens all the time. They're quite long, those 48-bit MAC addresses in hexadecimal. That's 12 hexadecimal symbols that you have to type in for each one. So I prefer the sticky command is kind of a, a more accurate way to be able to do that without having to really, really work with the MAC address. You'll have a lab where you do this and you'll be able to experiment with the three different violation um, actions. So there are three actions that iOS can take when a violation occurs, meaning a device plugs in with a MAC address that was not specified. It, by default, will shut down the port, but you have some additional um, options. You could set it to protect or restrict, and you'll read about those. They're slightly different, but they're uh, less, um, less severe than shutdown. Shutdown is the most severe if you plug in a device with the wrong uh, with the wrong MAC address, shutdown shuts down the port and it does not come back up until you manually, you the administrator, have to go in the switch, go into that interface and type no shutdown and turn it back on. It stays shut down. So that's really the most secure. If a hacker unplugs a PC or a printer in a hallway and plugs in a laptop trying to gain access to your network, it shuts that port down and leaves it shut down even if the hacker puts the correct device back in, the trusted device, uh, the port does not come back up until you type no shutdown. And so you see a log of when it happened, you know, date and time, and then you type no shutdown and bring it back up. And it gives you a really good uh, record of what happened and when and uh, make sure that type of behavior doesn't, you know, recur on your network. So you can take a look at how the three of those are related and how they do different things um, in terms of what they do. Port security, how to configure it. So there's the there's the steps and being able to, you know, set up your port security. And again, you're going to have a lab where you do this, so I won't cover the uh, the commands. But remember, they're they're very similar. One is just setting a dynamic port security. The other is going to be using sticky. And then how to verify it, right? You can go in and say how many maximum MAC addresses are allowed on this port. By the way, it's not limited to one. You can see that down in the lower example, we're allowing up to 10 devices on that port. So the first 10 devices to connect to that port are considered allowed. And the 11th device that ever connects uh, uh, causes the uh, violation mode to shut down, right? Causes the action of, of shutting the port down. Usually you want to set this to the reasonable number of devices that might be in a port. So for instance, in an office where there might be an IP phone, a printer, and a PC, and you might want to set it to three and then plug in each of those three devices. That way you don't have to worry about what port which device is plugged into. You imagine there's three outlets in that office, say. You don't want to be like, well, which one's the PC going now? So I just plug all three into each three of the ports and it learns those through sticky. And that way you can just kind of plug your devices into whatever port um, makes sense because uh, desktop technicians can you know, unplug, move around, plug back in devices there. And you don't want to have to intervene every time they move the devices around in every office. So just more about the disabled state. Remember, you have to manually re-enable the port because it does stay shut down. And you can verify that it is in a shutdown state. Let's look at the summary for this chapter. Okay, we talked about the LAN switch boot sequence. We talked about the LED 
um, indicator lights and the modes for those port lights on the front of every switch. Well, we talked about how to remotely access your switch uh, securely through an SSH connection. We talked a little bit about port duplex modes, and then we talked about security and some best practices for your switch network. Thank you.